So, hello friends. So, in this video, I'll be talking on this uh, basic topic, current practices of NIV. So, in the current situation of COVID, uh, understanding the basic tenets of non-invasive ventilation becomes very important. So, it's a overall brief about uh, the concept of NIV for all disease condition, not in specific to COVID. So, generally about how NIV works and what are the principles behind using NIV. So if you look at the whole science of NIV, so the first report of use of NIV came way back in 1936 in Lancet by UK group and since then uh, it has revolutionized the care of uh, acute respiratory failure due to various conditions with the use of NIV and these were some of the early equipments that uh, they employed. Uh, when they initially trialed out the use of NIV. So what is the definition of NIV? So NIV is where uh, you ventilate a patient who is in respiratory failure of some sort, either it's hypoxemic or hypercapnic by not inserting the endotracheal tube without the use of endotracheal tube, utilizing the respiratory mechanics of spontaneously breathing patients. So uh, assisting him with uh, ventilation is what we call as non-invasive ventilation. So in simple terms, it's delivery of mechanical ventilation to the lungs using techniques that do not require endotracheal intubation. So when we talk about techniques that do not need endotracheal, it is with various masks uh, used utilizing the respiratory mechanics of the patient. So what is the physiology of NIV? So I think this slide is very important. I put it in a pictorial format for you to just grasp what are all the utilities of vent mechanical ventilation. So it has at least some six effects on the lung. So what it does is it increase the alveolar ventilation. So where there is hypoxemia, so obviously your alveolar ventilation is affected. So it improves the alveolar ventilation and it recruits the alveoli. So in any disease situation where there is flooding of these alveoli with fluid like in pulmonary edema or in pneumonia where there is alveoli or collapse due to whatever inflammation or infection. So, or any situation where there is ventilation perfusion management. So, it helps in recruiting the alveoli and improving the oxygenation. And the third important utilization of NIV is to reduce the work of breathing. Because when someone is uh, having respiratory failure of any sort, there would be a lot of effort in the breathing that patient would be expending. So, there is a lot of energy and there is a lot of muscle, accessory muscles that you would be using that would fatigue him. To ease that work of breathing, non-invasive ventilation by providing additional pressures, it significantly reduces the work of breathing. So, this is also extremely important aspect as to how it helps. And most importantly, for cardiac patients, where they go into pulmonary edema due to left ventricular failure or any other situation, so, providing non-invasive ventilation by reducing venous return, it reduces the afterload. So, that also becomes a very important adjunct to all the therapeutic modalities one would institute in heart failure. So, so this is also extremely important that it does have a bearing on reducing the load on the heart. And most importantly, and another utilization stabilizes the respiratory muscles. So, where you may have trauma patient, where there is respiratory mechanics are impaired, so it does help in stabilizing of the respiratory muscles as well and uh, accentuate the work of um, and accentuate the ability to breathe better by stabilizing respiratory muscles. So, so this is a physiology of NIV. So I will just try to keep this simple. So these are the equations we talk about when we talk about uh, NIV. So how does NIV help? So basically I will make it simple. The P must is the respiratory effort that is uh, expended by the muscles to overcome certain resistance in the lung okay so this is the p mass is the respiratory effect effort that uh, the respiratory mechanics have to put in place to do effective ventilation so this p mass is equal to so whatever the effort we are putting is to overcome the elastance within the lung and it is to overcome the resistance so these are the pressures in the lung which you have to overcome to make ventilation effective. So there are elastance component, resistance component and there is a threshold component. So these are the three different pressures that you have to overcome for effective ventilation or breathing to happen. So and there is another pressure. So the P must if you have to extrapolate and these pressures have to overcome to over open the alveolar opening. So that we call it as alveolar opening pressure. So basically the whole respiratory effort 
is a combination of elastic pressure, resistance pressure, threshold pressure, which have to be which have to overcome the alveolar opening pressure for the alveoli to open. So, so whatever respiratory mechanics you would talk should overcome these pressures to cause the opening of the alveoli. So, to simplify that, so further extrapolating this equation, so the, the whole respiratory effort plus alveolar opening pressure is determined by this uh, uh, formula where E is the elastance, so it has to overcome the elastance and, uh, and this is determined by the volume, the amount of gases that enter the lung and R is the resistance and which is determined by the inspiratory flow and then this is the intrinsic peep to keep the alveoli open. So this is the uh, pressures which are overcome by certain volumes and by the uh, inspiratory flow to have effective ventilation to happen. So in simple terms for you to just remember there are three pressures that you need to overcome elastance, resistance and threshold pressure and this should be greater than the alveolar opening pressure for alveoli to ventilate effectively and these are determined by tidal volume and inspiratory flow. If you remember that, that should be good enough. You don't have to dwell into the specific of that equation. So when you talk of types of in, uh, non-invasive ventilation, there are four types, which you, but they are usually used uh, with a complex interplay between any of these modes. So one is the continuous positive airway pressure. The second would be pressure support ventilation. So the third would be bi-level positive airway pressure and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So there is a lot of overlap between these modes, but these are all the different nomenclatures that one uses when we are using non-invasive ventilation. Okay. So as I mentioned, it does reduce the afterload. So what are the pressures that, uh, that are overcome by non-invasive ventilation? So by recruiting the alveoli, because of the pressure we use in non-invasive ventilation, it recruits the alveoli. By recruiting the alveoli, it overcomes the elastance or pressure. So recruitment of the alveoli helps in reducing the elastance pressure and by providing intrinsic peep, it reduces the threshold pressure. So that is another way that it would be helpful in improving ventilation. And most importantly, NIV reduces the shunt fraction because typically in a pulmonary edema or pneumonia, so the, the, the pulmonary circulation is not participating in the gas exchange. So that we call it as a shunt. So your whole NIV will circumvent the shunt fraction and it reduces the shunt by uh, facilitating effective alveolar ventilation. So, so you, by recruiting the alveoli, it overcomes the elastic pressure and by intrinsic peep, it reduces the threshold pressure. So these are the pressures it has to overcome for effective alveolar ventilation to happen and reduces the shunt fraction. And in intensive care, most of the respiratory failures predominantly are due to shunt mechanisms. So you talk about pneumonia, you talk about aspiration, you talk about pulmonary edema. All these causes hypoxemia due to shunt fraction. And this shunt fraction is due to whatever flooding of the alveoli. And that is overcome or circumvented by non-invasive ventilation. By giving simple mask oxygen, it may not be effective in circumventing the shunt fraction. So that's what one needs to understand. So the main indications for CPAP. CPAP is just applying that PEEP to overcome the threshold pressure and help the alveoli to open is pulmonary edema and pneumonia. In pneumonia, there is a shunt fraction. Basically, the pulmonary circulation do not participate in the gas exchange because of whatever solidification of the lungs. So what about IPAP? See, we talked, we spoke about CPAP where it recruits the alveoli, reduces the elastance pressure and it produces intrinsic PEEP and then overcomes the threshold pressure. But what about IPAP? When we talk about inspiratory positive airway pressure or pressure support ventilation, so that helps in increasing the tidal volume and it helps in production of surfactant by the alveolar cells and facilitates good ventilation. So where is this needed, IPAP? So IPAP is needed to increase the tidal volume and your whole effect of increasing the tidal volume would be to reduce CO2. So typically we prefer to use IPAP in a COPD patients or where you have type 2 respiratory failure where we need to reduce the CO2. For reducing the CO2, you need to increase the tidal volume and when tidal volume increases, there is a reduction in CO2 and it also helps in, in facilitating surfactant production by the alveolar cells.
and by doing this it reduces two types of pressure elastic pre pre pressure and resistive pressure and in that together it reduces the respiratory effort so even the work of breathing or the whole respiratory effort is reduced by reducing these two pressures by increasing the tidal volume so these are some of the physiological aspects of NIV and when we talk about BiPAP or bi-level positive what it simply means is we are, pro we are providing IPAP at one level and then we are providing EPAP uh, so or it could be pressure support plus CPAP so these are the different combinations that we use in various types of respiratory failure so and all of us know the indications for bi-level where we provide IPAP IPAP we know that it increases tidal volume reduces CO2 and it reduces your respiratory effort by reducing the elastance pressure and resistance pressure okay so indications of bi-level or acute respiratory failure mainly COPD we tend to use and asthma so these are CPAP used predominantly in pulmonary edema or in pneumonias where to overcome the shunt bi-level we use mainly in pulmonary edema because you need more tidal volume to reduce the CO2 in COPD we use it and in asthma or type 2 respiratory failure so what are the contraindications for NIV so this is just a cartoon I have drawn so uh, there are six contraindications any upper airway obstruction you cannot provide NIV or you have an obtended patients where he has inability to take out secretions so obviously when they are neurologically obtended their ability to bring out secretions if cough reflex is poor and he has no ability to cough and clear secretions we cannot provide NIV or NIV cannot be provided in a uh, acute exacerbation of severe asthma and pneumothorax because the pneumothorax would worsen or GCS less than 8 but because we know when GCS is less than 8 they will have inability to protect airway and they won't be able to clear secretions we wouldn't want to use NIV and where there is gross hemodynamic stability instability suppose you have a patient with shock and respiratory failure providing NIV will further worsen his hemodynamic status and it may not be beneficial you have to intubate and take control over the situation so these are around uh, six contraindications so if you remember this picture I think you would pretty much know what are the complications of NIV there are nine complications listed so if you have a traumatic brain injury or if you have a patient with glaucoma it can increase the intraocular pressure and if you have a patient with any cerebrovascular event traumatic we don't prefer to give NIV because it can reduce the um, it can increase the intracranial pressure and because of the pressure we apply on the face uh, with various masks so it can lead to nasal congestion and it can cause nasal bruises which I'm sure any of you who have worked in ICU would have seen where people on NIV developing bruises and there, there is a potential risk of aspiration because you are providing PEEP and pressure support it reduces the venous return to the right side of the heart and if someone is hypovolemic or hemodynamically unstable it can lead to hypotension also and uh, there can be dryness of the mouth uh, because of uh, the interface of the mask and the oxygen that you would be giving and there would be discomfort and intolerance to the patient and there can be claustrophobia and because you are giving oxygen uh, there can be gastric distension with pressure you are giving high flows of oxygen that's why we prefer anyone who is an NIV to have a Rhinz tube so that this gastric distension does not happen and there is enough uh, aspiration of the GI contents and the gases from the Rhinz tube so these are around nine typical complications that we would see but they, are, they can all be circumvented by adequately uh, taking care and optimizing the patient so we spoke about the indication we spoke about the physiology then we spoke about contraindications then we spoke about the side effects now we need to know what are all the equipments that one needs to have in mind when you're using NIV there are uh, typically six sort of a checklist that you should have uh, one of the prerequisite for NIV we, we are talking about NIV in ICU which is with an ICU ventilator we provide ventilation this is not for a home BiPAP so you need a high flow walled oxygen to make sure that enough oxygen high flow is there to deliver good FiO2s and you need to have an adequate mask so you need to have a well fitting mask or an interface for providing NIV so th there are different types of masks which I will show you and uh, these are little important for all the listeners so you need to have a expiratory valve where you have an ability to provide a peep valve to give desired peep okay. so but uh, if you are using two limbed circuit you may not need this uh, expiratory valve with a peep to provide peep because 
uh, ICU ventilators, you would connect them to a two limb circuit, then people would be able to titrate in a ventilator. But if you are using a single limb, then you have this expiratory valve where you have a flow resistor or threshold. Basically, you have this peak valve where we put it, where it provides resistance to the expiratory flow and provides peep. That's what it is. So most of the ICU personnel who are working in ICU would know that we connect a peep valve, which, in, which sort of puts up a resistance to the expired flow of gas and provides additional peep to the patient. And it is desirable that the length of the tube is kept shorter so that there is not loss of huge dead space that happens. And it is desirable that the diameter of the tube is wide so that the resistance to the flow of gases is kept minimal. So these are governed by the gas uh, dynamics or gas flow dynamics. And, uh, and we should be able to provide variable FiO2 with the circuit. So these are some of the prerequisites. And uh, any NIV circuit that you are using should have sensors, flow sensor or pressure sensors to pick up all the pressure changes that are happening when you are delivering these gases. And most importantly, it is important in ICU when you are using NIV, it is uh, expected that uh, hum the humidification is facilitated by either using HME filter or heated humidifier because these are required to facilitate clearance of secretions and to prevent all the drying of the mouth and everything, mainly to uh, facilitate clearing of secretion. Otherwise, they will have a lot of crusting of secretions and uh, that can lead to other problems. So, humidification is important and it is important that NIV uh, circuit is able to connect to all these nebulizers because you need to have ports to connect these nebulizers to nebulize the patients and this is a vibrating mesh nebulizer. So, these are the uh, jet ventilators which you should be able to provide. Okay, so, these are the prerequisites. So, you should basically have a humidifier, then it is desirable to have the length of the tube little shorter and wider for uh, reducing the resistance to the flow and then it is uh, desirable, uh, definitely you should have a HME uh, filter and uh, you should have a battery backup also for these ventilators and ability to uh, connect the nebulizer. And you should have, if it is a single limbed circuit, you should need to have a peep valve to provide resistance to the expiratory flow, okay, to provide adequate peep. And battery backup is needed and apnea backup is needed. So that's about the uh, technical aspects of having all the checklists when you are using NIV. So how do we go about settings, ventilatory settings in left ventricular failure? So this is typically a ventilator has an immense value and benefit in patients with left ventricular failure or heart failure. So typically we provide a PEEP or CPAP of 5 to 8 to start off and then slowly increase. The reason why we do not put straight away 10 is because they can cause a lot of hemodynamic instability. So obviously you will be uh, administering medicines to optimize preload, optimize offload. Along with that, you initiate NIV or um, non-invasive ventilation or CPAP at 5 to 8 and if patient is tolerating well and hemodynamic status is good, you can slowly crank up the PEEP up to 10 based on the hemodynamic uh, acceptability and then obviously that would help in recruiting the alveoli better, dissipate the pulmonary edema and would reduce the work of breathing and most importantly it reduces the cardiac workload also by reducing the overload. And when you put on CPAP, so make sure that they are generating good tidal volume of at least 7 ml per kg because if they are not generating then it means that you may have to add inspiratory pressure or pressure support what we say and make sure that tachypnea comes down because once someone comes with LVF they will be hugely tachypneic. So once you initiate NIV if he continues to be tachypneic, then you have to tweak the ventilator. Either he is still hypoxemic or either his tidal volume being achieved may not be great or recruitment is not adequate. So it is important to see if respiratory rate is coming down and whether patient is becoming comfortable. If he is very diaphoretic, very tachypneic, so you need to see whether diaphoresis has come down, whether his tachypnea is settled and whether his oxygenation has improved or whether tachycardia has settled. All these are indices that your NIV is helping him get better. And generally when we initiate NIV, it is suggested that a patient has to be clearly explained that we will be putting this mask because some of the patients can have severe claustrophobia and they may not be able to tolerate NIV. So it is good to explain to them, this is only an oxygen which will come with a pressure and you have to synchronize your breath with the pressure that is delivered and this is only to help 
uh, patient get better. So that reassurance is extremely important, especially in NIV, uh, because they are very anxious, they are hypoxemic, and uh, so they would be struggling. So they will be very apprehensive. So it is important a bit of counseling and getting them to acclimatize to the pressure. That's why we build the pressure slowly rather than putting them on high pressure at the outset. And obviously you would titrate FIO2. Initially you may put FIO2 at 100% uh, if patient is very profoundly breathless and then slowly you will reduce it so that you are able to maintain good saturation with an acceptable FIO2 that you have titrated. And it is important to keep the peak pressures less than 25 to 30 because once you initiate, so the peak pressures also may uh, show higher in patients where the resistance is high. So you have to ensure that adequate bronchodilation if needed has been delivered to keep the peak pressures down. So what about the COPD exacerbation and non-invasive ventilation? So when you initiate non-invasive ventilation for COPD, it is important to see if pH is improving because they would have a acidemia because of high CO2 and you would see whether CO2 is coming down and whether short of breath is coming down. So you would give them a rough period of around 4 to 6 hours to see whether these indices are improving. So when someone comes say with a pH of 7.1 and CO2 of 80, you don't initiate NIV and keep quiet. Obviously you will initiate NIV and see whether these indices are improving, whether his work of breathing is getting better, whether his sensorium is getting better and whether his CO2 is coming down. So you need to monitor blood gas and ascertain this. And it has shown that use of NIV in COPD exacerbation reduces the hospital length of stay. It has shown to reduce mortality and reduce the intubation rates. And the success rate of non-invasive ventilation in COPD is 80 to 85 percent. So it has a very good success rate and it is considered as a quality indicator. Any COPD, we should give a trial of NIV before contemplating intubation unless they come fully obtended with a low GCS. Otherwise, a trial is mandatorily needed because most of them respond well to uh, this NIV. So this we did a study in our hospital Columbia Asia. So use of NIV is considered as a quality indicator. So we did this study in 2011. We did an audit rather of 318 patients to see how much NIV we used in different patient groups. And we had 115 patients with respiratory failure due to infection. We used NIV in 40% and in sepsis septic shock with respiratory failure, we used NIV in 19.6%. In uh, pulmonary edema due to CKD, uh, we used in 17.18. In cardiology where they presented with uh, pulmonary edema, we used in 27.2. So the, the quality benchmark suggests that 95% of the COPDs that come to a hospital should get an NIV trial before intubating. So, which means to say if 100 patients come with COPD, 95 at least we should have given NIV trial before whatever next step that we would have possibly taken. So, what are the ventilatory settings in COPD? So, in when, uh, mode in NIV, you can keep it as a spontaneous or timed. So, like in uh, heart failure or when we are using CPAP, I said you put a PEEP of 5 to 8 and increase to 10 to 12 to 14. So in COPD, you put up an IPAP of 12 to 15 to start off and we put an EPAP of 4 to 5. So then based on this, we would see how the response is. So if obviously CO2 is not coming down, then we would gradually increase the IPAP because we know by increasing the IPAP, it increases the tidal volume and helps in reduction on CO2 and may help in facilitating some surfactant production and it reduces the effort of breathing by reducing the resistance and some of the elastins as well. So that is uh, the way we would help in reducing the CO2. And if patient is profoundly breathless, so we keep trigger, we keep a high threshold of trigger. But in someone is obtended, we keep the trigger as low. Okay. And backup rate, we keep 15 breaths per minute as a backup. And we keep IE ratio 1 is to 3. So these are all a standard sort of a initiating settings that we would keep. Uh, but if someone is obtended, we would keep a trigger as very low. Otherwise, if it's very, someone is very tachypneic, we would keep the trigger as high. Okay. And before you contemplate on putting on a bilevel positive pressure, uh, so make sure there is no contraindication because if someone has a head injury with or a IC bleed with COPD, then obviously we may not wish to put them on NIV because it increases the ICP. And uh, before you initiate NIV, make sure they are on NRB so that adequate oxygenation is uh, facilitated. Uh, 
and as i mentioned and reiterated reassuring the patient is very important because they'll be very apprehensive they wouldn't know what you're doing suddenly there is a blast of air that will be uh, you know hitting them so we need to reassure them explain to them and whatever we are doing it is uh, to help them get better and uh, most important is the correct size of the mask because if you have a very small mask then it doesn't do its job or if you have a big mask for us uh, you know for a face which is small again there will be a lot of leakage and the delivery of the pressures that you intend uh, would not be achieved so uh, making sure that you are putting up an adequate size of the mask becomes very important and as i keep reemphasizing putting the mask reassuring all that is okay but after that most important thing is your job starts from there that you need to constantly keep a vigil as to how patients are responding to the niv so you have to monitor observe and regular assessments are needed so intubating a patient and taking it from there may be much easier than managing a patient on niv because once you put them on niv we need to see whether they are responding well and whether all the indices or variables that you expect them to improve are improving so more vigilance more diligence and more closer monitoring in a frequent intervals is needed when someone is put on niv and there are different type of masks so there are even nasal masks so some of the features is the connector to the mask should have 360 degree swivel so that if, uh, you know even if the tube skink and other things so this should be able to uh, turn around the mask and uh, the delivery of uh, gases is not hampered and uh, it is expected that they have this uh, foam bridges so that there are no uh, nasal bruises that happen because typically when you put ni with high pressure there is lot of injury to this nasal bridge so to prevent that it is expected they have a foam bridge and the quality of the mask should be thin flexible and the dual flap cushion is what is expected so these are some of the masks uh, and different features of the mask so helmet mask or the hood is something uh, that would be lot more comfortable to the patients because uh, uh, you know because of the comfort factor and because of his ability to uh, you know see and the, it does reduces the claustrophobia also so how do we monitor the response once we put them on a non invasive ventilation so the key elements that we would see is whether heart rate is coming down be it heart failure or copd or any of this first thing is you would see whether tachycardia because when someone is hypoxemic they would get tachycardia and you see obviously whether oxygen is improving and when they are in a respiratory distress putting lot of work of breathing their blood pressure tends to shoot up you would typically see in heart failure that they tend to have a hypertensive response which uh, again pushes them into more pulmonary demand it becomes a vicious cycle so because by putting niv it reduces the preload and it does reduce the afterload so you would expect the blood pressure to start coming down a little bit and your tachypnea also should come down so these are a simple clinical variables that we would expect to see them getting better and obviously you look at the accessory muscles of breathing whether uh, the accessory muscles of breathing is coming down slowly and uh, you would see if someone is little obstructed due to copd or even hypoxemia whether they are getting better with their neurological state improving mental status and sometimes when they are very tachypneic you have a dyssynchronous muscle movements and you would obviously see when the if the movement of the muscles has become lot more synchronous mm? and whether patient has become more comfortable and whether subjectively he feels there is reduced shot of breath so these are some of the simple things one would see to see whether your niv is working and as i mentioned already it is very important once you initiate on niv you would see whether uh, you know you would be monitoring abg and you would see whether abgs are slowly getting better so the treatment failure is indicated by obviously when patient condition is deteriorating despite whatever best efforts you have put or when there is a worsening of abg so when despite whatever pressures you have set to overcome all this elastic threshold or resistance pressure or the threshold pressure uh, if abgs are not improving with hypoxemia or co2 then you know they are not improving or when patient is not cooperating so this is a very common thing so especially elderly people who are in altered sensor it is very difficult for us to get them to tolerate niv so when they are not tolerating that is a sign that they are failing niv then you may have to think of intubation so the criteria to discontinue niv pretty much it is always intolerance when patient is pulling out the mask is very restless agitated so it's very difficult because all the benefit that niv confers uh, will uh, you know 
uh, will sort of uh, uh, go away when patient becomes non-cooperative because once you have initiated them an NIV, it means you have done a lot of things by reducing afterload, by recruiting alveoli and improving the shunt fraction. But once you take them, uh, you would have sort of uh, taken off all the beneficial effects that would have conferred and getting them again back to that baseline would become very difficult because again they get de-recruited, again the work of breathing increases and it's again pulling them back to that baseline becomes difficult. That's why intolerance becomes a very important uh, reason that you, you know, you would call it as a failure to NIV and then you'll possibly intubate. Then you have to think of intubation or when there is no improvement in oxygenation. He's tolerating NIV but there's no improvement in oxygen, then again it is NIV failure or patient becomes hemodynamically very unstable. So, suppose he is on NIV, he's tolerating but he becomes very hypotensive and is going into other organ dysfunction, then you, you know it's time that he have to intubate and he has failed NIV. Or if someone has an arrhythmia, suppose a heart failure, he's tolerating well, suddenly he has a VTAC or VF. Now obviously, he, you can't continue NIV, you have to possibly intubate him and get him better. So these are some of the absolute reasons where you would think that NIV has failed and that you would go ahead to intubate. So when do you sort of wean off NIV? So obviously, you would wean off NIV when there is a good clinical improvement, when patients all ABGs have gotten better, his respiratory tachypnea has come down, his heart rate has come down, his pH has improved. And obviously, he's maintaining good saturation of more than 90% on FiO2 of 40 or less than 40. Then you know that he has responded well. Then you can slowly wean off NIV and put him on a mask oxygen. So that's about in essence about the whole basic concepts of NIV. So now we look at is there evidence for whether NIV all, uh, now we know that NIV physiologically helps in improving oxygen, reducing CO2, reducing work of breathing, reducing afterload. But does it improve clinical outcomes? So we need to look into the studies. So there are a lot of studies. So in COPD, they have compared BiPAP versus pressure support ventilation or CPAP. And they found BiPAP is superior in COPD patients in improving gas exchange and reducing the work of breathing. So in COPD, BiPAP is better. But in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where you have pulmonary edema, they have done meta-analysis of 23 randomized control trials comparing CPAP and BiPAP and they found the mortality and intubation rates were no different between CPAP. So in heart failure, CPAP is good enough. What they need in heart failure is there's flooding of alveoli. They need good PEEP to recruit the alveoli and PEEP is good enough to reduce your afterload for the heart and it reduces the work of breathing also in that. And, uh, and when they compared to standard, both CPAP and BiPAP, uh, mortality was lower and intubation rates was lower. So this was a study from Australia. And uh, this was another study uh, in 200 patients in pulmonary edema. They compared between CPAP and pressure support ventilation and they found mortality and intubation rates were no different between CPAP, which means to say PEEP is what they need. They don't need inspiratory pressure because they don't need pressures to improve the tidal volume. So that's what it means. And, but however, short of breath resolution was better with pressure support, was earlier with pressure support ventilation. So these were some other studies, a few other studies from France and Italy, where they saw the mortality was slightly lower with, this is in overall patients, was lower in uh, non-invasive positive pressure uh, ventilation and the infection risk also was lower in non-invasive positive pressure when compared to intubation. This is comparison with mechanical ventilation. And intubation rates also was reduced by 20% by using NIV in a, uh, in these uh, respiratory failure patients or pulmonary edema patients. Okay. This is comparing to mechanical ventilation. So what about COPD? So COPD, this was a study which came from UK where they looked at meta-analysis of 14 randomized control studies, trials, uh, 758 patients comparing non-invasive ventilation with standard for COPD and they found mortality was significantly less when NIV was used and treatment failure was less 20% as compared to 42% in standard and intubation rates also was significantly less when they used NIV in COPD as compared to standard and hospital length of stay also was lower. So as you see uh, in pulmonary edema when you compare pressure support with CPAP, CPAP was equally good. You don't need pressure support. Okay, so but when you compare in pulmonary edema, you compare NIV with mechanical ventilation, NIV was definitely far superior. In COPD, when you compare NIV with standard, NIV had a significant benefit in reducing the mortality and reducing the intubation rate and reducing length of stay.
so so this is in cardiogenic pulmonary edema again a chinese randomized control trials 13 randomized control trials 1369 patients so as you see the mortality with cpap was significantly less compared to the standard and that was statistically significant and uh, this was another study from brazil meta analysis of 32 studies 2916 patients where they compared niv with standard they found mortality so all there are multiple studies which show use of cpap in cardiogenic pulmonary edema significantly reduces the mortality so that's why it has become a quality indicator and standard of care what about in hypoxic so we talked about pulmonary edema we talked about copd what about hypoxic respiratory failure due to any pneumonia or infection this was again study from uk uh, meta analysis of eight randomized control trials 461 patients ICU mortality, there was 17% absolute risk reduction with the use of NIV as compared to the standard and intubation rate also there was 23% reduction in absolute risk reduction. And this was another uh, study from the Spain, 105 patients uh, were in pneumonia, hypoxemic respiratory failure, they compared NIV and standard. As you see ICU mortality was 18% compared to 39% and intubation rate also was low. So even in hypoxemic respiratory failure due to pneumonia or any infection, use of NIV was found to be better in reducing the mortality and intubation. So this was again a US study which showed hospital mortality was reduced and intubation rate was reduced. So in what about in immunocompromised? So in immunocompromised patients also it is shown that the use of NIV reduces the ICU mortality and reduces the ICU length of stay, reduces the intubation rate. So in immunocompromised Early usage of NIV is what is recommended. It does significantly reduce your risk of intubation. And what are the predictors of NIV failure? Anyone who is on a vasopressors, which means they are hemodynamically unstable. So they are at a risk of failing the NIV trial. Or anyone who is on renal replacement therapy. Uh, basically anyone who is going into other secondary organ dysfunction, they are at a risk of NIV failure. And this is very important. So the failure of NIV is when there is a delay in administration of NIV so from the admission so when there is an increased time lag between the admission and the initiation of NIV it is shown that possibly fail so the sooner you use better is the outcome that's why you would see in heart failures initiation of NIV in ER itself may help them get better fast than waiting for them to reach ICU and then initiating so that also is an important factor to remember so other conditions where NIV can be used is in post extubation. Suppose you have intubated a patient with uh, say pulmonary edema or heart failure. When you extubate, anticipating that they may go back into pulmonary edema or they, uh, they may go back to retaining CO2, you can extubate them to NIV. That is also and pre-intubation uh, giving a trial of NIV so that to recruit alveoli and to pre-oxygenate lung effectively before intubation also is something that could be done. And someone who is on end of life who would not want intubation, you can give a trial of NIV and end it there. So, to, to the final slide on summary and recommendation. So, NIV, as you all have understood, it is ventilation by non invasive means through a mask of some sort, either by a face mask or a nasal mask or by the helmet mask. And grade 1A recommendation for NIV is in COPD. So, in COPD, one name is strong recommendation, good level of evidence for COPD. So, as you saw, 95% of the COPD should get a trial of NIV before contemplating intubation. And grade 1A, strong recommendation, good level of evidence in cardiogenic pulmonary edema because you saw multiple studies, at least 6 to 7 studies, which showed equiocally improvement in mortality, reducing the length of stay, and reducing the need for intubation. And grade 2B, is weak recommendation with a moderate level of evidence is hypoxic respiratory because you saw three studies even in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure due to aspiration or pneumonia it did have a benefit at least in mild cases in reducing the mortality reducing the risk of intubation and prevents recurrent respiratory mm -hmm. failure and the most important thing is initiating as soon as possible uh, before you know they worsen would be the key essence in improving the outcomes and if there is no improvement after you initiate, then obviously you may have to plan for intubation. And most importantly, NIV is very safe. There are no deleterious. You saw the side effects are very few. So there is no huge side effect profile. So, but you, you have to bear in mind some of the contraindications for using. So thank you very much. So if you wish to rehear to this lecture, you can visit my website www.drpradeeprangappa.com to rehear 
and clarify some of your thoughts. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always write to me. So thank you all.